Hello, my name is Mel, and this is my capstone presentation. Uh, before I begin, I just want to make a quick content warning that I will be talking about death and I will be showing one picture of a dead body. It is not very gruesome. Just want to let everyone know that I will also um, tell you right before I show the picture, just to remind you. Uh, so the project I did for my capstone was a study of food and death as they relate to each other and as we can use them in the process of mourning and bridging the gap um, between living people, dead people, people speaking about death, people who don't wanna talk about death, maybe food is a way that we can um, bond and heal together. A little bit of backstory. Um, two years ago, I lost one of my grandmothers, um, not biological, but still very close to me. Um, she lived in England. She was biking on the way to um, a Pilates class and she had a heart attack under a bridge, which is kind of an epic death. And it made a lot of sense for her as a person. She was very vivacious and loved, um, loved learning from other people, loved her hobbies and her many careers, which included dancing in the New York City Ballet with Balanchine, which you can see a picture of on the far right to writing numerous cookbooks, a few of which I have um, got the covers of. Uh, she loved cooking. She loved being a mother and a grandmother. Um, she was always someone that asked a lot of questions about what you were doing with your life. And she loved to talk about um, new ideas or keeping up with the news. Um, and then a few, a year and a half later, last summer, my mother's mom, Mary died, uh, she had dementia and cancer and she was living in a nursing home. She was a mother of five children, my mother being the youngest. She had many grandchildren and her whole life was full of care and nurturing. And she uh, worked really hard. She was kind of a single mom, um, raising many kids and working full time. Um, and it was always just super compassionate and super loving. Um, sorry, did not give a warning, but here's a picture of her on the day that she died with my mother, who's not, who's not masked, um, but wearing full PPE. This was kind of at the height of COVID before we got vaccines. And so very few people were allowed to go into the nursing home. Um, but in the last week of her life, my mom was allowed to go visit her and they talked briefly my grandmother was pretty incapacitated. She couldn't really talk that much. Um, but she, on one of the last days that she did speak, she connected closely with my mom and they bonded and laughed together and like held each other's faces. And then the nurse came in with a glass of chocolate milk, which my grandmother hadn't eaten in days. And it was kind of clear that she was going to die soon because she hadn't eaten, but she, her face lit up. She was so excited to see this chocolate milk. And she said, my gosh, chocolate milk. And that was actually her last words. So she, those, <laughs> she was so excited by the chocolate milk. She drank the whole thing. And then two days later she died. Um, and on the day that she died, my mother was the only person in the room when she died. And my mother sat with her body afterwards. And then my dad and I came in and that was kind of a special experience for my mom. And I could assume my grandmother too, because in a way it felt like my grandmother brought my mom into the world and my mom kind of escorted my grandmother out. So they kind of completed this matriarchal cycle. Um, and after both of their deaths, I started to think about how can we remember them after a period of like regular mourning where people say, I'm sorry for your loss. And you say, thank you. What else as a culture, as a society, do we do? We just don't talk about death that much. We don't talk about it in social situations or in like, casual situations that aren't focused on death. And I thought that's kind of a shame. I think, I think people are scared to talk about it, but I, I'm also scared to talk about it. I don't know how to breach the subject. Um, and so that kind of came up as a question, how do we remember our elders? How do we honor them when, when they're dead without making it awkward? How do we honor their life and be happy about it? Um, 
and specifically grandmothers, just because I lost two grandmothers, but also there's something so special about like matriarchal love, like historically women have had to run families and nurture people and something about that is so powerful that kind of love and like once you've lost someone that would give that love like it's a huge gaping hole so like I feel like that's a pretty universal thing that we can all connect on so originally I wanted to do a really large um kind of performance installation piece about death um, and matriarchal death and different people's experiences, anecdotes about my grandmothers. They both had really interesting lives, um, but it ended up seeming like too complicated to do now. And I also feel like I'm not old enough to, I like, I wanna definitely do this project, but later on in life when I feel like I have more um, like tools in my toolkit for creating work, it feels like I wanna honor these people in a way that I don't, yet know how. So I put this on the sidelines. I was also kind of scared to do it, um, which speaks a lot to my original question being like, how can we address this? And so maybe not addressing it in this huge, broad project. Okay, doing a huge project on death. Maybe that's not the best way to address it. So then I started to think about food because both of my grandmothers had such a strong connection to food and I love food. And there's something kind of universal about the way that we um, engage with death around food. So many religious and cultural practices have to do with like mourning and food rituals. Um, and also there's kind of like life being the antithesis to death and food being the thing that keeps people alive. There's just felt like something very universal and um, central about food in this exploration of life and death. Um, and then I started thinking about recipes how recipes could kind of maybe be the bridge between life and death because the recipe of someone who was alive but is no longer alive can be shared and can be continued um, past their life. And so it kind of extends someone's life and their influence on others through food, through their um, recipes. Um, so then I thought, well, maybe I should make a cooking show kind of like Julia Childs meets the Adams family. So it's like dark, humor about death and my grandmothers and food, but also a cooking show. So I had recipes um, of my family or other recipes that people connect to um, around death. And for similar reasons, I felt a little bit overwhelmed by the process of making that. Um, I didn't feel like competent enough to write a script for that. So I put that on the back burner as well um, and started thinking, Again, how can I find a way of connecting food to death? On my bookshelf in my house, I found an old book, which in the background of almost all of the slides are pictures from it that I took. Uh, I found my great, great grandmother's cookbook that she wrote um, just for family. It included a lot of recipes from friends and other family recipes, as well as like newspaper cuttings, which you can see on this page. And she died over 70 years ago. I don't, I don't know her. She lived in like the 1800s and the early, like, I mean, the 1900s, like turn of the century kind of. And so that just feels like so far away. And when I think about people of that era, they're kind of like characters or kind of two dimensional um, representations of what life could have been. But in this book, I felt like a, a stronger connection to uh, my family and just a life and history that we don't normally get a view into just with her little notes like oh I add a little extra butter here or um, a smudge of flour on the page just brought these recipes to life and it felt like um, a time capsule like I could connect to someone I didn't know through our shared love of food through the things that she made um, and so it got me thinking are there, do other people have family recipes? Do other people connect with their elders or lost loved ones this way? Uh, so I shifted my capstone goal and decided to make an anthology of recipes, family recipes from diverse perspectives, not just my own. I wanted to hear from other people with different cuisines, different life experiences, different experiences with death. I think it's just more interesting to have that diversity. And I had previous experience with Wix, which is just an online editing software. So I felt that maybe rather than making a physical like bound book, it would be easier to make 
um, a live website that acted like a cookbook and an anthology of stories where people could add their own and have the process continue and kind of build a database of family recipes and experiences with death. Um, and these are some pictures that I took of food um, that I made for a previous project, but that kind of gave me the confidence in editing that I knew I could um, take pictures and format stuff on this online editing software. Uh, so the first step in my new goal was to reach out to people I thought would like to contribute. I mainly reached out to people um, like middle-aged people because they were more likely to have experienced death of a parent or grandparent. Um, well, and also the generation seems to like connect more with recipes than our generation does. Maybe it's an age thing, maybe it's a generational thing, I'm not sure. Um, I've also reached out to people with diverse backgrounds, like I said on the other slide, just so that we'd have more cuisines than just the one that I'm used to. Um, and most of the people I reached out to were family friends of my parents or neighbors. Um, and I started receiving responses, uh, some in the form of short stories, some, a lot of the people I reached out to were writers. So most of them were sh short stories or poems. A few people asked to meet or talk on the phone, which I also did and recorded the conversations and then edited down the conversations to take myself out of them and use it kind of as like a um, verbatim um, audio interview. Um, and then along with that, I also transcribed all the recipes that they either told me, described them, because a lot of the time it's like, oh, she made something that was really yummy. I don't really remember all the ingredients, but had some of these things. So a lot of the recipe work was kind of piecing together what potentially could be in these recipes. A few people submitted like really clean, organized, like PDF recipes, which is easy to use. Um, but something I started noticing was a general lack of conversation about death and loss. It seemed like people really wanted to talk about the lives of these people, um, about their grandmothers and mothers, rather than the experience of lo losing them or the ways in which they were able to mourn um, and use food as comfort. Um, and so that became kind of a struggle for me. I started questioning, oh, am I doing something wrong? Maybe my prompt was unclear. Maybe it seemed like I was asking people to tell stories about the living experiences of these people and that the fact that they were dead was just a prerequisite rather than kind of the point. Um, and I was pretty uncomfortable following up with people about that. I didn't wanna pressure people. I felt a little awkward just emailing them and be like, hey, can you talk about your trauma? Hey, can you talk about your experiences with death? Um, that just also felt wrong. So in the process, I struggled to get answers and also to put myself out there um, to ask for that more um, heavy content. Um, I learned quite a bit in the process. Um, the fact that so few people wanted to talk about death, I think is telling in, the, in my initial question, which was like, how can we bridge this gap? How can we begin this conversation? And the fact that the conversation still has kind of yet to be had with a lot of the people I interviewed um, I think speaks to our just cultural um, sensitivity around death and also the way in which I approached it. I was really um, intent on grasping hold of what death is and how we can understand it. But the thing is like, it's so elusive to people that are alive because we can't experience it. It seems obvious, but you have to kind of remind yourself over and over again, like, no, actually there is no real way that we're going to understand this. Um, and the fact that so many people just wanted to talk about their joy and memories of like sharing food with their grandmothers uh, taught me that maybe the way in which we address death is not as linear, is not as direct, but in that we can honor people's lives and um, enjoy and appreciate the life we are living is a way of addressing death in itself. Um, and also that, the food can be healing without us having to talk about it. Like sharing the food and tasting the flavors that your grandmother uh, raised you on can doesn't have to be direct. It can just be a feeling that um, brings you comfort and that in itself is a way of healing from loss. Um, in terms of personal growth, I think I 
gained more skill and understanding and how to reach out. I did a lot of cold calling, like people that hadn't reached out to me first. I just said, hey, I'm doing this project. Would you be interested in participating? And I got a lot of really positive responses. So that definitely uh, taught me that you can just do that. It's okay. Um, I also like brushed up on some photography skills and like editing skills to make the project, the final product work. Um, and similar to the first networking skill, um, I gained understanding in interviewing people. Uh, I spoke with Rebecca Coates Fink a little bit beforehand about um, my apprehension about asking people about death. And she suggested, like I did in this presentation, begin with my own experiences so that I set a base ground of like, this isn't me asking just to hear about your experiences for the use of my project. It's a shared conversation that we can all have about death to heal collectively. And that was really a helpful um, tip. Uh, so here, if all goes well, is the end result. Let's see. So here's the website. All the pictures, except for like three, I'm still waiting to finish editing, are original that I took or were sent. A lot of the PDFs that were sent also had like scribbled designs or like the covers of the books I was using. So there was some really great um, visuals that I was able to like glean from what people sent me. Um, I am calling this project right now, the immortal recipe for, for the reasons of the recipe can um, bridge the gap between living and dead. Um, and I so kind of similarly asked questions um, to the reader of the website were kind of like my, my guiding questions. Um, I also added a section where you can share your own recipe. So anyone visiting the website, if someone something comes up for them, they can share it directly and I will receive it and then um, kind of vet it, but then put it into the website. Um, I have a page dedicated just to stories and each of the stories relates to a recipe. So each person that submitted a recipe also submitted in some form a story or an anecdote. Um, I spoke a little bit about finding the cookbook in my house. Um, this is one of the stories from my neighbor, neighbor Norma um, and another one by Robin and Pow. I'll go to all of these in a second. I'm just showing the whole layout. I had my mom do one. Um, I forced her to talk about death, um, but I think it was a good conversation for both of us. She, we've already had a similar kind of um, bridging that gap conversation before. Um, I reached out to some of my teachers as well um, who shared stories. And then here's the recipe page. So if anyone visiting the website would click on any of these links and it brings them to a new page um, where it shares the ingredients and the recipes. And then from there, you could travel back and read the short story that the person submitted. So they're kind of automatically linked that way. I'll go to a few others just so you can see a little bit of what they were. This looks really good. Um, Ms. Adams, the NHS math teacher shared this. I really wanna try this recipe. Um, and she wrote a little bit about her mom here. Um, here's my grandmother's apple crisp recipe, which I have made before is really simple. Um, those are my grandmother's hands the day she died, which I just think are really beautiful. That's another thing I was really interested in this process of like not shying away from the physical experience of death. Like I spent a fair amount of time on the day that my grandmother died um, being in the room with her body and sensing like herself grow cold, but also sensing how she, her presence in the room dissipated over time, which was really powerful. Um, and I felt like she was like present rather than physically present in the body that was in front of me. Um, and then I didn't show all the pages, but there's a few. And then here's another page of um, connecting or contacting me if you had any questions. Um, one more page I wanted to show just because the formatting was a little bit different um, 
was Pau Atella, um, who's a math professor at Smith. He shared um, a recipe from his Spanish grandmother who made a really simple soup. And instead of uh, telling me, we just had a long conversation where we did like math art in his driveway and talked about it in like the pouring rain. And it was really fun. So I don't think the audio is going to work if I share it like this, but I will add a, I will, I will add a Zoom <laughs> link and for people live, I can send it to you if you all want. No, you can try. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'm going to turn my sound up. Sound up, sound up. <laughs> mm. I don't think it's going to work because okay. I don't think it's going to work because I'm on Zoom on this computer. Um, and finally, I just want to thank all the people that were part of making this happen. I interviewed a lot of people and um, I'm still waiting back on responses from other people because this is an ongoing project. Um, so if anyone here has knows of anyone or has their own experiences, you're totally welcome to reach out because um, I want to continue to make this um, accessible and have it grow. And finally, I want to thank all the matriarchs that taught us and helped us make this from a really long time ago or from recent to living people now. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. So we have a little time for questions for Mel. And those of you online, you can either speak up or put it in the chat and I can read it for you. Pearl? I actually haven't, and I really want to. That was originally my plan was to try each of them and then like take pictures of that and put it on the website. Um, no, I have not, but I will. I'll get back to you. I think they're, they all look really good. Um, yeah, and pretty simple too. Bella? Thank you. Um, all the food photography photos I did earlier for a project in the fall. So I just had those on hand. Um, in terms of the cookbook itself photography, I just used a Canon DSLR camera and then used Adobe After Effects, um, not After Effects, Lightroom. It's like Photoshop, um, just to adjust some like um, exposure lighting stuff. Uh, yeah, the, oh, I will show you one more thing if people wanna see it quickly, because the vibrancy of these photos is not, mm, is not as strong as it would be. Like I dimmed it down so you could read the words better. So you can't see the pictures as well. Um, but I can show you some of the cookbook pictures because I don't know how big it is, but it's just like so beautiful. I have struggled really hard to try and read a lot of these because the cursive is pretty fine print. It's like a very small book, um, but it's just so beautiful that just the textures of it. Um, and that's the cover. And she had like a whole system. Yeah, Mina. Um, it's, it's like this, uh, I have like nothing the right size. It's like this big, it's pretty small. So the print, it's all made with like, a, um, it's all ink, you know what I mean? Like they didn't have pens when she was making this and the binding is all gone. Um, it's made with resin, so like, like animal or um, wood stickiness are keeping the whole book together, which is also kind of cool to see like old binding techniques. Um, she also did like in the back pages, like a lot of newspaper printings, which is really cool to see. That's actually an upside down picture, but ho hopefully people don't really notice that. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize when I was taking the picture, I'm dyslexic and it like, I didn't notice. Um, yeah, that's that's it. And the pages are just like, these pages aren't, but one side of the book is gilded, which was really cool. The pages like had gold leaf on them. That's it. Yeah, Ella. Have you thought about writing down any of the That's a good. I actually haven't at all, but I might. It's because I'm not dead, I felt like I couldn't <laughs> really put it in there. That's true. That's true. I, I'll start now, and by the time I die, then they'll be exactly. Yeah, that's a really good idea.
Um, those are all the pictures I have. Um, no, I have a, I don't know if it's a question, but you reminded me of something. I, we've already spoken about this. I, my father passed about a month and a half ago. Um, and you're right, it's like trying to talk about the death part is just complicated. Mm -hmm. And the one place you, you brought back to my mind, you're talking about your grandmother's hand. Yeah. On the day my father passed, as I spent some of my last time with him, it was his feet. Interesting. And I, his feet became so beautiful. And, and I thought, should I be grossed out by this? But I actually took to his feet in my hand, holding his feet, and sort of just loving the shape and contours of his feet as I, you know, as I watched him and thought of it. This is after he passed. There is this interesting thing about the moments of passing, the mm -hmm. hour of passing. You talked about the um, feeling her presence in the room and then feeling it dissipate. Yeah. You know? Did other people, were you able to get the people talk about the day that someone passed at all? Not yet. No. Other than my mom, not yet. I mean, I think, it's, I think it's that the passage itself, the day it happened, where a lot of the, our more powerful experiences are engaged, mm -hmm. right? Like, like, struggle, like struggling to, um, we have to get a dress, right? Yeah. Taken away, and, and I found this shirt that had the logo Angel Flight on it, which <laughs> is a service run by hundreds of different people from here to fly needy kids to hospitals. That seems and like just, the perfect name. Yeah, you pick up the shirt and you go, oh my God, right? Yeah. It's a picture, you know? Yeah. So it's those things that occur to you. But this is this endless question. How do you, you do talk about life? When mm -hmm. we're trying to talk about telling you that. Yeah. That's how we resurrect. Right? To keep but, the memory alive. But talking yeah. about the, the other half that it brings. It's a very eerie experience. It feels yeah. like I've never experienced like birth. I've never been in the room with someone being born. But it, I feel like it could have a similar yeah. gravity. Like yeah. it's n unlike any other experience. And I wasn't even there like the moment she died. Right. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. All right. Any other questions for Mel? We're all good. Well, Mel Lowenthal, thank you very much for a thank you, Steve. Journey. Oh, the other thing I realized while you were talking, which is just really just odd, but I, I when we're cooking food, we're killing it. Mm. Right. The death of the apple, the death of the animal. Right. That's in order to keep us alive. And I just thought that is also really interesting too. That's a good point. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.